The way that Google started was an academic venture. How do you find interesting problems in the world? Google depends on academia. So many of the good ideas that we've brought forward to the world come from academia. One of the real reasons to engage with academia is to get a really fresh perspective. We empower academics to work on real problems and in the other direction, academics bring ideas and new approaches that are put into practice much more quickly than in an academic environment. You know, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. All of a sudden you knitted together something that is really, really tremendously powerful. We need their help because of the problem we're trying to solve internally. Academia can look far out into the future and can take greater risks and look for really interesting solutions that industry sometimes cannot. My name is Ken Goldberg. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley in the College of Engineering and School of Information, and I run a robotics lab there where we do research in areas like surgical robotics. And what I'm really excited about right now is cloud robotics. And I am Matej Okudlie. I am a research scientist here at Google. I am part of the robotics effort, hoping to advance the state of robotic mobile manipulation and allow robots to do things that they're not able to do today. Well, I've been interested in this field for a long time, since I was a kid. I think every kid gets interested in, in robots. We, we sometimes talk about them as the, the gateway drug for, for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's because the robots are, are very compelling at all levels. I think kids are, are, are captivated by them, but really adults and you know, anyone is interested in the idea of making something that can, that can become alive. Cloud robotics has a long history. The way I think about it is it goes back to early work when the, the internet emerged in the early 90s and a number of groups started putting together robots with the internet. And the idea was that we could use the, the resource of the World Wide Web as a standard to allow people to come in from anywhere in the world and operate industrial robots. It, it, it truly is a symbiotic relationship, right? At, at, at Google, one of the things we deeply care about is understanding the world. Well, the one thing that's, that's really emerged in the last couple of years is a way of thinking about the cloud as an active resource. When the building that I, my office is in was constructed only 10 years ago, there's an enormous uh, basement that was dedicated for computing facilities. It's empty now because we don't do that. We don't, we don't actually have computing in the building. Um, everything is done on the cloud. When we need vast computation, we use um, you know, cloud clusters on demand. And that makes a lot more sense because they can be centralized, they can be shared, they can be upgraded and maintained. Sharing is a really important part of it, right? Imagine if, if, if people, if we had to advance science, but we couldn't leverage anything that any other person has done in the past. We couldn't teach each other verbally or through the written text. And in a sense, that's where robots are without sharing. And cloud, the cloud, mm. can enable robots to share knowledge, to share things that they've understood about the world. We were saying about, um, you know, it's interesting that sharing has become this very, you know, it's a whole new, it's, it's reached these new levels, right, where people share every detail of their life, <laughs> what they had for breakfast, uh, where they were. And, you know, in a sense, though, um, there, there is this idea that robots can start doing something similar. They can say, hey, I just learned how to pick up this, um, this pair of eyeglasses in a new way and instantly share that with every other robot. So if another robot comes and sees that pair of eyeglasses, they know exactly what to do. And that, I think that idea of, of, of accumulating information is really what's been happening with the web at one level but can now enter an entirely new level. Working closely with James and his his, uh, his colleagues, we were able to actually get access to the to the computing engine, um, and we could we would be able to take images and do experiments that we reported in a conference paper last year, and we're very excited now about taking this to the next level. We have a number of ideas about how image libraries or actually um, libraries of of 3D objects of solids and mechanics can actually be used to enhance grasping using ideas that 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 Matei has pioneered, where we can do, for example, very, um, very complex 
computation about grasp strategies, but these can be pre-computed in the cloud and then stored so that they can be indexed online very rapidly when a new object is encountered. The field has really changed dramatically in the last couple of years, and particularly last year with the announcement by Google that it was getting into this field in a big way and acquiring a number of major companies. The, the, this has been a big boost for, for researchers. I think bringing a critical mass of people like Matei, James, and many of my former students together here is, is really creating this, uh, this, this, this critical mass where lots of interesting things are, are happening. Um, getting this uh, uh, agenda together where they're bringing skills from, from many different areas to, to, to focus on problems of robotics is very exciting. I think that also because Google is really at the forefront of the cloud, you have all the skills in robotics, traditional robotics, um, or advanced robotics, I should say, and then you're combining them with all the skills of the cloud, and the, the potential here is enormous. One of the, the questions is, is what are these robots going to look like? And my own feeling, I'm, because I work also in factories and, and factory robots, I'm not convinced that, the, that, that robots are necessarily going to be humanoids. I think that they're not going to look, um, that we, we really, this comes back to Sigmund Freud, actually, who wrote about the uncanny, and the, the ideas about the uncanny valley uh, indicate that if a robot looks too much like a human, it actually leads to a, a, a sense of discomfort for many people. Right. And, and so I don't think we necessarily need to go there. I think we want a robot to look like a machine. It'll do something that will go around and, and clean up our house, for example, keep our floors clean, or maybe someday um, keep us company. But I don't think it needs to look like a human to do that. To me, trying to copy the human with a robot, you get what you had you know, hundreds of years ago when people were trying to build flying machines by copying the birds. And you had devices that flapped wings and looked more or less you know, biological Bird and, and fell off cliffs, right? Whereas when we finally understood the principle of lift, that's when you know, flight took off, right? So a robot doesn't necessarily have to copy the human. If we try to copy the human, we'll copy the wrong things. A robot needs to have a function and get, get a job done for us. And if it doesn't look human when doing that, that's fine. Right. So we might not even recognize right now when we look, you know, when we look, um, we, what robots may evolve to are things that we may not even be able to imagine right now. I mean, they may not look like what we think they're going to look like. So it's a pleasure to come down to Google where all this is happening really at the, it's the center of all the action. And for a lot more details on all these topics we talked about, see my talk.